Sunday morning Bible study. Uh, as you know, God is worthy to be praised. He's worthy to uh, of our attention, our adoration, and our love for him. God is certainly awesome, and we thank God for everything that he is doing in our life. We thank God for the his son, his precious son, Jesus, who died for us, and for the Holy Spirit that lives within us. We are so grateful to be alive today, to be able to, uh, to worship God in our right frame of mind, and we are just excited as to what God is going to do in our lives. I would like for you to keep in mind, new to our prayer list, Brother, James, Brother Butler. Brother Butler is undergoing dialysis and um, as you know, many of you who know who experience dialysis know it takes quite a bit out of you. So continue to pray for Brother, Brother Butler. Continue to pray for his wife, Sister Butler, Idonia Butler, uh, for strength and health uh, and health and well-being for her as she takes care of Brother Butler. Continue to pray for the daughter of Brother Brent Williams and Loretta James who was diagnosed with cancer. We're at such a young age, and so we want to pray for uh, the daughter of Brent Williams and Loretta James. Continue to pray for um, all of those on our pr uh, prayer list who are ill and um, just striving and struggling to deal with um, the health battles that they are facing at this time. So let us keep all of them in your prayers that God will uh, get glory in it in the end. Now, let us finish what we've been studying in Romans chapter 12. For those joining in with us, we have been studying the attributes of God, and we are on the mercy. We are rounding the table concerning the mercy of God. And when it comes to the mercy of God, we have seen that God expects us to respond properly to his mercy, that we aren't to simply be the recipients of God's mercy, but we as children of God must respond positively to the mercy of God. And we saw in Romans chapter 12 that uh, Paul, uh, after the theological emphasis that he gives and he lays out for the child of God to know and understand, he then moves into the practicality of living out the theology that he has explained and expressed to them. So now Paul explains to them, or he urges them, he, he challenges them to present their bodies by, well, he, he challenges them on the basis of the mercy of God. The thing that they should do is present their bodies. And, though, and their, present, their presentation is based on the mercies of God. And so we, we labeled that uh, the basis of their commitment, the basis of their commitment. You can even say the basis. What is the basis of their consecration to God? So the basis of their commitment and consecration to God is the mercies of God. And we saw that the greater the comprehension of what God has done for us leads to a greater commitment of uh, a, a greater understanding of what our commitment should be to, toward God. Uh, we have seen that Paul urges them to know God's will, which will then be seen in them doing God's will. Oftentimes we stop at knowing God's will, but we don't put into practice doing God's will. And so Paul will challenge them that based on the mercies of God that you present, you go on presenting your body. Now, we saw that the word present means to place beside, to put at one's disposal. It is to make available or accessible. It is to furnish or to provide. And so Paul says, make sure that you present your bodies. You can even say, present yourselves. Make or uh, furnish yourself. Make accessible yourself. Um, uh, make available yourself, your body. Make yourself available for the disposal of God's service. He says your response should be on the basis of God's mercy. And your response 
should also be that you continuously present, make available, make accessible yourself for the service of God. That's the proper response to, to the child of God concerning the mercy of God. We must make sure we are constantly, continuously striving and seeking to present ourselves uh, for God's use, for God's service. Dear friends, do not make the mistake of believing that the only purpose that God has set forth for you on this earth is simply to live. You ever heard someone say, it seems that we are just simply living here on earth. I have no idea what my purpose is on earth. I, I don't know why we are here. And I remember Oprah in an interview with many stars at, at this particular time, movie stars and athletes and, and uh, even poetic writers. She asked each and every one of them, uh, what do you think your purpose is on, on life? Or what is our purpose, mankind's purpose here on earth? And all of them gave different answers. Some were far-fetched, but all of them were different answers to the question. The child of God should never, ever guess what their purpose is on this earth. God has placed us here so that we may glorify God in our bodies. As we live on earth, the child of God, our purpose is to give and bring glory to God for who he is as our creator. And so your purpose, that's your purpose. So how is it seen, uh, uh, how is it played out, this purpose played out in our life? We start by responding properly to the, to the mercy of God by presenting ourselves as available to be used for God's service so that God will get glory uh, in the service we render to him. That's your purpose. Now, we make sure you do not confuse your personal purpose and agenda with God's purpose. God's purpose is always to bring him glory. God's purpose for us is always to live in harmony with the will of, him, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's purpose for us is to be transformed into the image of his dear son. God's purpose is for us to put away the sins of the flesh, to put away the desires of the world, and be conformed to the, uh, to the image of God uh, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, to look more like his son, to be a body of people that look like Jesus, that will ultimately, here it is again, to bring glory and honor to Almighty God. That's what our purpose is, dear friends. Now, he says, go on presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, notice the character of this commitment, the character of this consecration, is that you must voluntarily present your body. Now, he gives a command, present your body. But it's still based on you voluntarily offering yourself. Offering all of you. The burnt offering, dear friends, was to be consumed wholly on the altar. Completely sacrificed to God on the altar. And it was to go up. It was in the worship category sacrifices which went up into the nostrils of God as a sweet aroma. So Paul says, if you, uh, if you understand, if you understand uh, God's purpose in the Old Testament, and you understand that we were to consecrate ourselves completely to God then, then in the New Covenant, we are to completely offer ourselves wholly, completely, without reservation to God. He says, present yourselves so that your life, in essence, will go up as a sweet aroma to Almighty God. 
He says, so this is Old Testament language in which the, the worshiper would voluntarily bring their sacrifice to God and symbolically uh, con uh, transfer sins to the animal and then consecrate, dedicate their entire life to God. Here it is, because the, the sacrifice would be totally consumed on the altar. It was to be holy, burned, and sacrificed on the altar to God. He says our life, our entire life, must be consecrated, dedicated, and committed to God. I told you on the last study, God does not want a part want part of a Christian, God wants all of the Christian. God doesn't want a part-time Christian. He needs and he's looking for a full-time child of God. So we are to, the, the, the character is that we, of uh, this commitment is that we voluntarily offer. Now watch this though. You voluntarily offer what already belongs to God. Hear me carefully. When you offer yourself to God, you are doing God a favor. You are actually offering yourself. You are offering what already, what originally belonged to God in the first place. You belong to God. Adam and Eve belong to God. Satan stole the relationship by getting them to obey him instead of God. Now God has to bring uh, this relationship back together and it would come through Jesus Christ. We offer, dear friends, our life, our time, our gift that God has given us, our finances, we offer it all to God because it belonged to him in the first place. I keep trying to tell Liberty City, that's why you should never use the terminology, my money. That's why you should never ter use the terminology, my life, it's my life, it's my body. It belongs, all of it, to God. And God expects us to offer all of us to God, to back to him. So then, this voluntarily offering is, is, off, is an offering of what already belongs to our God. We put our bodies, church, at the disposal of God. Now, here's something else. When we begin to present ourselves to God, we are giving, here's what we should do. And, and bear this in mind. We are to give as much of ourselves as we can to as much of Jesus we know. We are to give as much of ourselves as we can to as much of Jesus we know. So the more you know of Jesus, the more you give. The more you become acquainted with Jesus, you grow in knowledge of him, not simply book knowledge, but experiential knowledge. You, the more you know of Jesus, the more you are willing to give. Church, I cannot emphasize this enough. God is not, he is not moved and he is not proud of half-hearted Christians. Either you are in it fully with God or you are not. There are no in-betweens, and Paul shows us this, that there are no in-betweens with God. Either you are with God or you are not. Either you are committed to God or you are not. Either you are fully vested in kingdom business or you are not. Either you talk a good game or you walk the right game. God says, I want all of you to go up daily in my nostrils as a sweet aroma. So we are to give as much of ourselves as we can to as much of Jesus we know. 
Find a child of God that won't give, that won't give of their time, that won't give of their gifts, and it will signify just how little they know of Christ. And I'm not talking about verbal gymnastics. I'm not talking about just saying I know Jesus. No, in your actions. Find a child of God who claims to know Jesus, yet they don't give of their time. They are not in ministry. They are not giving financially to the kingdom work. They are not doing the things that, that, uh, that are becoming of a child of God. I'm telling you, church, just read your Bible. That is a child of God that shows little knowledge of Christ. You cannot claim to know. And listen, this knowledge of Jesus, let me express this to you. This knowledge of Jesus is not contingent on how long you've been a member of the church. Because there are some there are some young people, there are some new Christians who, who because of their acquaintance and knowledge and their, their relationship with the Lord, they know they know more about the Lord than those who've been in the Lord's church all their lives. And here's how they know it, because they live it. That's the difference. That's the difference. So he says, give as much of yourselves as you can to as much of Jesus you know. Now, let's notice the demands of the commitment. Now, the demands of the commitment is this. Do not conform. Now, he says, Present, well, let me back up. He says, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, we dealt with all of that last study. As a living sacrifice, which is holy, set apart, consecrated for the service and work of the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable. It is logical. It is, uh, it is the service or worship you render to God uh, based logically on what your inner man has come to know. So he says, this worship, this service you offer is reasonable. It's worth, it's logical. It, um, it's rational. It is, it makes sense that the life that I live now equals to the gospel that saved me. And the life that I live looks like a reflective of the life that my Lord and Savior lived. Therefore, it's reasonable, rational, it's logical that I present my body as a living sacrifice. This isn't, this isn't uh, some irrational Christianity that we follow. This thing is logical, it's intelligent, it, it is to be understood, and, it, and because of its ability to be understood, it, uh, it allows us to actually live out the very thing we believe, the thing that saved us, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So Paul says it's a reasonable, rational, logical service. Now watch this. The, the demands of this commitment and consecration lie in what Paul wants us to do next. He says, do not be conformed. That's the, log that's the, the logical demand of this commitment, that we are not to be conformed. It comes from a Greek word which means the schemes of this passing world. It is to pattern oneself after. Uh -huh. It is assuming an outward expression that does not come from within. So now Paul says, do not assume or take on an outward expression of the world that is di in direct contradiction to what's inside of you. You have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. You have a new man inside of you. You are walking in the newness of life. And he says everything internal must line up with everything external. We are looking at a series on Sunday morning, straight walk, but a crooked, uh, straight talk, but a crooked walk. What is the point of emphasis? That you make sure as a child of God, your straight talk lines up with how you walk. Paul is, in essence,
essence saying the same thing. When you conform to the world, you are being patterned and shaped, fashioned after the world and the mindset and the thinking of the world. He says, do not be conformed. Do not take on the pattern. Do not take on the, 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 the outward expressions of the world because it doesn't reflect who you are inwardly. So anytime, this is why you hear people often say to Christians whenever they, whenever they, uh, they act out of character or they say some things or they live a certain way, notice what people always say. I thought you were a Christian. You know why that is? Because outwardly, what we do is not adding up and making sense to the world concerning who we claim to be inwardly. Everything about who we are inwardly, our transformation, who we are becoming must always look and be uh, expressed outwardly in our physical, physical body. So Paul says, do not be conformed. Do not take on the expression of the world. Do not fashion yourself after the patterns of this world. Be not conformed, but be transformed. Metamorphumai, be ye transformed. Where we get our English word metamorphosis. He says, do not be but uh, conformed, but be transformed. How, now, transformed means changing the outward expression from that which he has to a different one. Changing, uh, you be, it's like being a chameleon, changing the outward expression from that which he has to a different one. It is metamorphosis. It's what you see in Jesus in Matthew chapter 17. You remember when Jesus was taking Peter, James, and John up onto the Mount of Transfiguration, and there Jesus, they, they beheld that Jesus was transfigured right before their eyes. Jesus, his face became bright. Uh, uh, and so it was a transformation uh, of his outward expression. But that out, what he had become transformedly in his outward expression was a, uh, it was a direct consequence of what he was inwardly. So his body was carrying around in him who he was. He was the express image of the Father. He is the radiance of his glory. And so as he carries this around in his body, what they see on the Mount of Transfiguration is what Jesus always was, and that was glorious. He now, he now expresses it outwardly, which changes the, the, the initial um, body of what they saw. So here they are on the mountain, and Jesus changes. But he didn't change, he always was. Which means, Paul says, now that you are in Christ, now that you have become a child of Christ, what you are inwardly must metamorphosize. It must transform. It must change into uh, or be seen in your expression outwardly. Be ye transformed. And here's how you know it comes from the in. It comes from it, it comes inwardly and moves to outward expression because he said, "Be not conformed, but be transformed." By the renewing of your mind. That's inward. Now, renewing church is renovation. It is a complete change for the better. He says, renew your mind. That's where it starts. The mind, church, is the faculty by which the soul perceives and discerns good from and truth. It is the seat, the mind is, is the seat of intellectual moral judgment. It is our ability to think correctly and morally. So he says, be ye transformed by the renewing, the renovation, 
the complete changing of your mind so that you can think correctly, morally, and spiritually. Your mind has to constantly be renewed. So the renewing takes place by way of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It is the Word, church, that renews the content of our mind. It is the Spirit that renews the ability to think properly. So if you are not thinking properly, it would suggest that your mind isn't being renewed. Well, now I need you to know something. How are we going to renew it? Reading the word? Sure. Studying God's word? Sure. But that's not the end all be all. You have to put it into practice. But here's what the dilemma is. When he says be transformed, it is a passive imperative. It's a passive command, which means God is enacting the transformation on the child of God. Well, if it's God who is effecting and enacting the transformation on the child of God, then how in the world are we to be transformed? How, what are we to do in the transformation process? You go on presenting. You have to make yourself available in order for God to enact the transformation on you. God isn't going to hold your hand. He isn't going to pull you by his spiritual string and rope. You must make yourself available to have your mind renewed, to have your body presented and available at God's disposal. We have to re have a responsibility to allow God to enact and effect transformation on our lives. You've got to study your Bible. You must read your word. You must stay connected to God, but you have to make yourself available. You go on presenting. Sure, it's passive. God is enacting the transformation. Oh, but there's a responsibility on the child of God to make sure we are there presenting ourselves so that God can transform us. This is why it's dangerous when we use slogans a lot of time. I'm a work in progress. Yeah, that is that on the surface, that's true. When God is allowed to work on us, we are a work in progress. But when we are doing whatever we want to do and we, we, are, we, are, we are acting the way we and living the way we have decided we're going to live, then we have to stop using that slogan, I'm a work in progress, because God ain't going to work on anybody who is, who is far away from him. You've got to be in the right place. You've got to be in the presence of the Lord. You've got to present yourself available so that God can chip away, that need to be chipped away, so that he can mold you and shape you into who he has called you to be. You've got to make yourself available. So let's stop using, I'm a work in progress, as the way of justifying our wrongdoing. Let us make sure that, sure, we are a work in progress, only when we make ourselves available for God to use. So he says, make sure that we present ourselves and make sure that we are not being conformed, but we are being transformed. And then make sure we make ourselves available for the renewing of our mind. So, the character of this, of this commitment is that we refuse to be conformed, but we make ourselves available to be transformed. And our transformation takes place inwardly because our mind is being renovated. And then he tells you what the purpose of all of this is. Here's the purpose statement. So that you may prove what the will of God is. Put to the test so that you may uh, put on trial what the will of God is. How in the world will you ever know what the will of God is and what God expects of you if your mind is not renewed? It's impossible to know what God's will is for your life and your mind is conformed to the world. You cannot, you cannot know what God would have you to do. You cannot.
cannot do God's will if you are so consumed with the world. If all your mind and thought and think patterns are conformed to the world, how in the world can you do the will of God? And better yet, how in the world will you even know the will of God? He says, that's, that's, that's the purpose so that you will know what the will of God is. Now let's look at the effects. The effects of this commitment. Now notice verse 3. For, throw, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think as so to have sound judgment. There it is as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. He says we all have the same amount of faith, measure of faith given us. He says so the effects is that I will know the will of God, right? And uh, how do we have knowledge of the will of God? Of course it's studying the word of God, but this will of God is now it, uh, it takes place in the mind of the child of God, which is constantly being renovated and renewed when that person, that child of God, constantly brings himself, presents himself to be used at God's disposal. Now, when you have a renovated mind, the effects of a renovated mind, the effects of this commitment says, I think rightly about myself. I think properly about myself. When you are, are, when you do not allow yourself to be conformed to the image of the world or to, to be fashioned and shaped by the ways of the world, the world philosophy, the thinking of the world, then you are able, it, it enables you, for, to, friends, to think properly about yourself. When you can think clearly and properly about yourself, then you know what God expects you expects of you and how to take care of your body. I, now, I'm not necessarily talking about working out and lifting weights, but how to present your body to be glory to, to bring glory to God. You you will then know what the will of the Lord is when your mind is being renewed. When you are being transformed, you then know, you think properly about yourself. That's, and, and what happens, see, a child of God who thinks properly about themselves, they are prone to allow people to project on them what they think about them. No, children of God who think properly about themselves allow God to project upon them what he thinks about them and what they should think about themselves. That's why when you think properly about yourself, you aren't swayed by every wind of doctrine or every uh, news of gossip or, or every negative bit that comes by. You aren't swayed by that stuff. You aren't moved by that stuff. You, you hear it, you stay the course. You get it from out of your uh, uh, from your presence, and you continue to do what God has called you to do. Why? Because you know the will of God. How so? Because your mind is being renovated. And what did you do for it to be renovated? You constantly made yourself available by presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Then the person. So he says, "Don't think highly of yourself." He says, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If it's prophecy, according to prophecy, to the proportion of his faith. If service, it is his serving or he who teaches in his teaching. So now we think properly. Two things. We think properly about ourselves. We are high minded. We are humble people. And we think properly about our fellow man. Our brother and sister in Christ. Then thirdly we think properly about our gifts. Now all of this 
is contingent on your knowledge, your awareness, and your appreciation of the mercy of God. Notice, he says, we think properly about ourselves. Don't think so highly of yourself. Then secondly, we think properly of our brothers and sisters. For just as we are many members in one body, all the members, we do not have the same function. In other words, there is room for everybody to get involved. Everybody God has given a gift. Everybody God has given a talent or something that they are, uh, they are able to do. You got to make yourself available first. But then he says every one of us are members of the same body. So we think properly of ourselves, we think properly of our brothers and sisters, and now we think properly of our gift. God gave it to us, which means if we don't use it, God has every right to take it away. So we think properly about our gifts, properly about our fellow believers, properly about ourselves. And it's all because we understand the grace of God. So worship, church, worship does two things. Worship, worship brings glory and honor to God, and worship remains in, our worship, should I say, remains in consonant with the gospel. Yeah, worship signifies the offering of the whole self in course of concrete living in inner thought, feelings, and aspiration. Our worship, church, our worship signifies the offering of our entire self. Yeah, and it's, it, 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 it is in the course of concrete living, inner thought, feelings, and aspiration. It's all consumed in Almighty God. So he says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to each of us, it is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, uh, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good. Be devoted, look at this, to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another. I think properly about myself. When I'm able to think properly about myself, then I'm able to think properly about my fellow uh, brother. And here's the thing. Because I think properly of myself, because I'm not high-minded and arrogant, then I'm not uh, intimidated or I'm not threatened by other people's gifts. Because I think properly about myself. And as a result, I think properly about my gifts. In other words, because of the mercy of God, not only did he save me, but he gave me a gift to be used to glorify him. So I don't have time to, to sit here and, uh, and, and hate on other people and to speak bad about somebody else or something another child of God has decided to do and get involved and to work. No, God gave me a ministry. Uh, uh, he gave me a gift. And so I, what happens, I spend more time trying to exercise my gift than I do worrying about someone else. Keep in mind, church, our entire life is based on the mercies of God. Our worship to God, whether it be in corporate worship or I be at home or on my job, my entire life is to be a sweet-smelling savor to God. It is to go up to God as a sweet aroma my entire life. And so that's worship to God. That's service to God. And it's rational. It's reasonable. 
Join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for blessing us with your dear son and the precious blood that he shed for our sins. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for being our God. We pray, dear God, that you will strengthen us uh, in the areas that we have wronged you. Strengthen us, Father, in our weakness. Strengthen us, Father, so that we uh, will understand the depths of your mercy. Father, we thank you for loving us in spite of us. We thank you, Father, for allowing us the privilege to worship you and to uh, bring glory and honor to your name. Father, help us because we, don't, we, we are a people who can be obstinate in our thinking and our attitude toward you. We can be sometimes rebellious. Father, we ask that you have patience on us and you have mercy on us. Father, bless us that we're able to show forth your power in our life by the way we live, the way we talk, and the way we treat our fellow man. Father, we pray and ask for your blessings upon those who are sick and afflicted, those, Father, who are still struggling with the death of their loved one, we pray, dear God, for your mighty hand of comfort and healing on their life. Father, help us to realize, dear God, that you are in control, that you are still awesome. We thank you, Father. We glorify your name. Bless us with a wonderful week. It's in Christ's name we pray.